This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at Zendaya's tennis-themed romance drama, Challengers. The new movie, Civil War, starring Kirsten Dunst as a wartime photographer. The Holocaust drama, Irene is Thou. The action thriller, Monkey Man, which marks the directorial debut of Dev Patel. Plus a new documentary that looks at the life and career of funny man, Steve Martin. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rosen, and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly critic roundtable show, where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me are Bill McCuddy from GoldDerby.com, Lisa Rossman from The Ruby Report, and Roger Friedman from Showbiz 411. Now, let's start out with a look at several new films or series in theaters and or streaming, beginning with Challengers, starring Zendaya. Let's take a look at a clip. Are you on Facebook? <laughs> what? He's asking for your number. And so am I. You both want my number? Very much so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not a homewrecker. We don't live together. It's an open relationship. Oh, so Patrick has a girlfriend. I do not. Hey, come hang out with us later. They put you up at the hotel in Flushing, right? We're in room 206. Want me to come tuck you in? No. We can just keep talking. About tennis. Good night. We have beer. <laughs> okay. Lisa, let's talk about Challengers. All right, Neil. This is the hotly anticipated newest from Italian director uh, Luca Guadagnino, who is responsible for the two seven, 2017 queer love story, Call Me By Your Name, hot, hot, hot. This one is a love triangle no, between three things. extremely yeah, hot, see the theme here, tennis players, wired. played by Zendaya, Josh O'Connor, and Mike Feist. And it's an energy drink of a movie. It's over the top, it's not especially good for you, but it is undeniably effective for a brief amount of time. It's set between the mid-aughts and the late teens, and it begins with Zendaya as an up-and-coming tennis player who's toying with these tennis player best friends, played by O'Connor and Feist. But when she sustains a career-ending injury, she channels those killer instincts into making Feist the star uh, by both coaching and marrying him. And the film intercuts between those early scenes and a U.S. Open Challenger match when the former boy besties face each other for the first time in a decade. For me, the fun of this film is not in the obvious questions like who's going to win, um, who will she end up with, and how far will it take its undeniable homoeroticism. It's more the how of it. The popping edits, the bass-heavy soundtrack, the sidelong glances, and the fire performances, especially from Zendaya, who I think is the first real movie star we've gotten in a long time. I think the movie loses momentum, and it doesn't seem to care much about classic sports movie tropes, but it really wasn't until afterwards when I was walking home from the movie that I was like, I think it's about the trying to get your groove back is always a fool's errand. Bill? Yeah. I didn't like uh, a couple of things this director has decided to do in what I'll call one of his big commercial outings, and that is uh, late in the, in the movie, there's a walk-around tornado happening <laughs> in, uh, in one of the towns, it completely took me out of this film, and it has one of those free, without giving too much away, one of those crazy freeze-frame endings that really wants to tie everything up in a neat bow when it's not. This is a high adrenaline film. Mm -hmm. I like the uh, energy drink comparison, but you will crash and burn You're after crash. it's over. You will. Uh, it's a movie basically about sex for young people. Mm -hmm. It'll be a big hit. I'm sure by the time this airs, it's already been a big hit. A mm -hmm. uh, 22-year-old young lady, I won't say girl, was sitting next to me, <laughs> and she just adored it. I think the two male leads are going to become big stars, especially Josh O'Connor, who Roger mentioned to me. He's was, already was, a big star. Yeah, he in the, big was star. in the crowd, but I think <laughs> Catch crowd, up, Neil. But I think this guy is <laughs> going to be like a superstar. I, I think the guy was terrific. I think all I'm three leads together point. have tremendous chemistry, and that's one of the things that makes the thing work. Yeah, there's flaws in the movie, but when you, at the end of the day, this movie is fun. I think that it will be a crowd pleaser, especially for yes. fans of Zendaya. And, you know, there's grown-up themes here. You know, as you mentioned, Lisa, the homoeroticism is something that this director is very familiar yeah. with. And, you know, I like the movie. It's entertaining. It's not, you know, a Citizen Kane, but, you know, compared to, like, a Marvel movie... This was a refreshing change of pace, mm -hmm. and I couldn't agree with you more, Lisa, that with the crowd that's into Zendaya, that age group will find this... They're going to um, go nuts. They're going to love it. Moving on, Roger, let's talk about Irina's Vow. Okay, on, the, on a more serious note, Irina's Vow 
uh, is a, a wonderful Holocaust film uh, about a real person who saved lives during the Holocaust, and her name was Arena Gutt. Her married name was uh, Arena Gutt Updike. And this was a play originally, and uh, now it's a movie. Sophie Nelise is the star of it. She's in a remarkable performance as Irina, who was a Polish nurse who was picked up in Warsaw, uh, 1939, arrested, went to work for a general in the army, and started hiding uh, Holocaust victims in the basement of his house. It's a true story, and unlike some other Holocaust movies we've seen recently that got a lot of attention, like Zone of Interest, this movie really has a heart and you can actually follow uh, Sophie Nelise's character uh, very carefully. So um, it's, it's a remarkable film. I'm, I'm sorry that it doesn't have a bigger distribution or a, a bigger distributor, but uh, it's certainly a movie that everyone should see in theaters and if not, see streaming. It's such a good movie and it's such a good movie because it's true and it's made all the better if you watch the end credits, which I won't reveal because it's right. a spoiler. They tell you, you what like, happened to oh, each person. Oh my God. And but there are some jaw dropping moments when those credits go by. So I just want to make sure people stay till the very mm -hmm. end because There's a couple of jaw some of those people. There's a couple of jaw, -drop jaw dropping movie moments in the movie itself where it's not all just this fable right. of her taking care of these people, but there's a real actuality of the Holocaust in Warsaw that uh, you have to be braced for. I do appreciate this one's focus on the female angle. I, I really appreciate that it's a true sure story, um, which kind of makes the moral clarity uh, that it models deserved. even more amazing, even more affecting. It would be interesting if somehow they had taken out some of what's in the middle and put that in for me. Interesting. Well, you know, talk about hiding in plain sight. I mean, the only next step would be let's let's hide the Jews in Hitler's basement. I mean, this is like the most unlikely place that anybody would think one of Agreed. the highest ranking people of the Nazi party. Nobody would ever think to look there. And the twists and turns of this movie, there again, because it's true, yeah. this this will be on my 10 best list for the oh year. My God. I mean, it's involved. Also, I love Doug Ray Scott as the general. Oh, yeah, we haven't seen, he doesn't work as the a major. Lot. Yeah. No, I mean, the major. Scott right. was an actor that yeah, was, was coming good. on and was going to be like the next kind of Jude Law, and unfortunately, he's become the next Jude Law. I don't Law. know. It's really involving, <laughs> it's important. Ultimately, it's, it's an excellent film. Civil War looks at a dystopian future where a small group of journalists are covering America's second civil war. Let's take a look at a clip. Someone's trying to kill us, we are trying to kill them. You don't know what side they're fighting for. Citizens of America, people of the Florida Alliance, you gotta move! and the Western forces of Texas and California <laughs> will be welcomed back to these United States as soon as their illegal secessionist government is deposed. You don't know what side they're fighting for. Lisa, tell us about Civil War. Well, Neil, uh, this is the latest from director Alex Garland, who's made a career out of making slightly futuristic sci-fis that are nearly, not nearly as insightful as they credit themselves for being. Uh, this one is by far his most problematic. <laughs> Essentially, it's a road trip movie focusing on four journalists, among yeah, them Stephen so McKinley so Henderson so and a dead-eyed like, Kirsten Dunst, who oh all four of them like, are racing like, from New York to the White House him. to cover an so American civil far. war between secessionists yeah and the jackboots of a, th a third-term president, played by Nick Texas Offerman. We get virtually no information about the ideological stances of either side None. here, None. which make it seem like Garland is suggesting the real enemy is the desensitization of America caused by the media itself. A desensitization, I think, ironically, Canada. film actually contributes to by subjecting like us to nonstop visceral explosions, murder, torture. The glaring issue here is that this is a political movie that refuses to take a political stance, which in this cultural moment, in my opinion, is a let em eat cake indulgence that borders on downright dangerous. Frankly, leave it to a white rich guy to think you can make a movie about the crumbling American experiment without discussing race, gender, or capitalism. Yes, I, you, you're, you can't have it both ways. This guy goes out of his way not to, like, offend red state or blue state people. Right. And it, 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 it's you so You have tepid. no idea 
what side anyone is on. Right. Correct. Through the so entire really, the movie is just about the media, and the media. There's not even but a there's social no structure for, for them. To, right. Wait, wait. They take really good pictures. The media, and I don't know where they file these pictures yeah, anymore exactly. because nobody. There's they, no they, internet. Who's, taking, no say this who's too. taking pictures? Alex Garland has been spending the last few weeks just backpedaling, talking about the fact that he did all of this intentionally because it could happen in other places besides the United well, States. Can we talk about? And, and I want to mention yeah. also that this he wants us to believe that. Whatever the backstory is that he didn't tell us was so in, inflammatory that it got Texas and California to Together, join forces, which makes no sense. But right. actually, uh, the, about the, the blue state and the red state. This right. is ridic it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That's, the that's your alliance. Says, the photographers I want to talk about because is it her, Callie Spaney? Is that how you say yeah. her name? She is taking pictures with film. The other photographers are taking digital pictures. Now there's been a complete apocalypse. Right. So is she stopping at every town to go to the 7-Eleven? No, but who's Both taking failings. pictures right. in this day and age? I mean, what is this? I'm taking pictures that can be published in Life magazine or something? Who's even look, reading magazines? Look, magazine. People take you know what the shame of there all, all this is? The shame of what, you know what the shame of all this is? Is that it might have been a decent movie had he told us what was going on in the country. Well, that's what because we're going to talk now, about in this documentary coming up. Yeah. Now, and no two people, by the way, can agree on whether that's Trump or Biden in the White House. And so it well, it's supposed on, to be Trump. It, well, because he has know, I thought tie. it was Biden. You, somebody else said me it's definitely Trump. Right, that's how ambiguous this movie is. There's no context in this movie. Look, you're dumped into the middle of this movie. It's like the set of The Walking Dead. They're going on a, on roads with, with, with abandoned cars and, and burnt out movies. There, I have you have absolutely no idea why this happened. What, you know, who, like what Roger said, who the, is the president? Like a Trump guy, a Biden guy. I'm completely confused, and it doesn't answer any questions whatsoever. I think this was a tremendously missed opportunity. It's yes. inconsistent because when they leave New York, you you look around and there's devastation, and then they have a look at the New York skyline and it's perfect. In the capital. And then this you're like, death. what yeah. happened? They left New York alone because they liked it? Yeah. it? It makes absolute, the movie makes no sense. Correct. Well, there are a lot Every of confusing of questions that need to be answered, and maybe there's another documentary, Neil, that answers them a little better than Civil War. Well, yeah. this is a great documentary. Oh, there it's is? It's called Against All Enemies, <laughs> and Roger's going to tell us it about is. it. It is. It's called Against All Enemies. It's directed by Charlie Sadoff who had uh, an amazing amount of access to people like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, uh, uh, militia no, people, neo-Nazis, and the real people who would have formed the, way, the basis for this angry. movie, The Civil War. And if only their stories had been told, uh, the, the Against All Enemies stories had been told in Civil War, uh, even at the beginning, mm. you would have had an idea of what Civil War was about. But watching this documentary, Against All Enemies, you actually get the idea. You're actually frightened about the people that you're meeting. They are crazy. But we live in a bubble where these people don't exist. But they exist not that far away from us. And they are a lot of retired military people who lost their minds from the pressure of war or the pressure of, you know, uh, explosions or whatever, murders that they saw in front of them. And instead of coming home and trying to do something to make life better, they have retreated to... Uh, these militias in places like Montana and North Dakota and well, they're Idaho. They're recruited. They're vulnerable. They're that, recruted. Yeah, yeah they lose their minds is a little offensive. I think it's more they're more easily manipulated because of the programming. But they've once gone they're through. programmed, they're in, and there's no getting them back. And they are out there and they are conducting drills or whatever. And you, we think here, sitting here in New York or if you're in a major city, you're thinking, oh, this is just a small thing that's not a big deal. But it actually is a big deal that the FBI is working on every day, yeah. keeping an eye on, because these people are extremely dangerous and could start a civil war like the civil war in the movie. I mean, this is a devastatingly impactful, diligently laid out real life horror story, essentially, of the true terrorists that are living in this country and the rising movement that suggests January 6th wasn't an so much as a foreshadowing. I think this film is a chilling, essential viewing, and I wish it was actually getting broadcast so people would, you know, it, for two hours, so or on, on repeat, so people would really have to get it that this is happening. You know, I agree with all of you, and I'm recommending the film, but I will tell you, and I'll give this as a note to news junkies, you probably saw this all coming, yep. uh, if you've been following anything going on in this country. No, but what's so uh, great about the film is that it, it pulls it together for the first time. It does pull it together, time. it absolutely yep. does, but I'm just saying, who's surprised here? January 6th, heads no. organization? Great, Nobody's going to be surprised that, at that. Is that the filmmaker Charlie Sadoff 
got access, which is incredible, to the leaders of the Proud Boys right. and the Oath Keepers. And plus, there's all these talking heads that you recognize from all these news stations who talk about the worst scenarios. And the point is, is that if you think that January 6th can't happen again, it's gonna, it, it could, they tell you that it could happen again. <laughs> right, what that's what I just said. Right, but it could be worse. It could, be, it, it could actually be worse. And that the greatest threat in but America... But you weren't surprised by anything you saw. Well, they say that the greatest threat in America, I think that's another point, is, is the domestic terrorism from within. Well, unlike civil, the movie Civil War, this movie has so much context that it takes you back all the way to the original Civil War yes. and how, the, how it started with the KKK you know, had to suppress yeah. black votes and how they wanted white supremacy and how from, from the 1860s and everything in between, I mean, talk about context. This gives you an entire. I mean, th this should be required viewing for for everybody but in this country. It, it, it's, it's urgent. Let's do it's it. brilliant and it's terrifying. Now let's switch gears completely. And I mean, talk about 180. Let's talk about this wild and crazy guy. Well, excuse. <laughs> no, there's I'm a, sorry. Yeah, uh, it Steve is time Martin to change it up a little. And uh, Apple TV is helping us a little bit with something called Steve. Uh, parentheses Martin exclamation point a documentary <laughs> in two pieces uh, a title almost as long as the film itself which at three hours and 11 minutes maybe a little more Steve Martin than you actually need uh, I was intrigued by a part of this uh, as I was with his book called Born Standing Up about how he got into the world of stand-up and how he was fearless uh, and it's all there. I mean, he he sucked for a long time. He stuck with it. He st he did what he thought he was what he thought was funny. And uh, people like Jerry Seinfeld, Lauren Michaels, uh, Tina Fey, and Diane Keaton are all here to say uh, what a genius he is. But I got to tell they you, also say that they I, that they don't really know the guy that they've known right, for years. He is, and they, a, they he is no an unknown entity. But he is a pack rat. He's got everything oh, that he ever Steve wore in Martin. anything, and he has a beautiful house. So I recommend watching the first part of this motion picture and not staying around for the second part. Look, I love Steve Martin. <laughs> you got to do a Boston accent for that one as much as any other 70s kid. But this film suffers actually from an abundance of Steve without ever scratching beneath the surface. Thank like you. over and over we are told he's a really hard person to know. And I feel like eventually you realize this may be the film's built-in excuse for again. offering us so much filler. The irony to me is actually as a fan of his writings, I can say that Martin himself goes way deeper in his books, in his New Yorker essays. I would have liked more actual comedy, which I'm sorry boys, is the only legitimate reason to watch a documentary yeah. about a comedian. Although when he and Marty are throwing ideas back and forth yeah, for their funny, for their traveling it's, show. You know, it's, great, it's cute. You know, I saw Steve, I'm going to give away sort of my age. I saw Steve Martin perform in Boston in 1976. So, uh, so you're I, born in the 20s. I with was, an arrow in his head, <laughs> with a white an arrow suit in his head, uh -huh. and you know, before even on a wild and crazy guy. Uh. And he was phenomenal. He was already, you know, a cult. There was already a cult following behind him. And that's the part of the movie that I really of the documentary yeah. that I really enjoyed. Seeing that, uh, learning, you know, you find out about comedians, all comedians at some point, that they're not really funny at home. Yep. They're hard to get to know. That uh, Johnny Carson was like that. I think even Jerry Seinfeld is like that. And certainly Larry David. But all, all of them were like that. And they all had a projection to the audience that was quite different than their personal lives. And if the, if the documentary concentrated a little bit more on his act, it, it would have been a little funnier, I think. First of all, I couldn't agree with you more, Bill. The first part is terrific about how he put his act together, how he was bombing in the beginning. Nobody really even understood it, and he's playing these small clubs. How he worked in Disneyland as a kid and started to, like, memorize the act of the guy in that Golden Horseshoe review when he was... A, like, I found all of that fascinating, how he crafted this persona. Okay, but, this, but, it, but this, it's too long. The second part, it's like... There's way too much time spent on his art collection, right. you know, so and really only murders in the building. And yes, so I did like the riffing back and forth with Martin piece. Short, but that was too short. But the problem is there's a lot going on here, but it's not what you wanted to see. And if you bought my album and you came down here expecting me to do a lot of routines from the record and I didn't do them, well, excuse me! This guy was getting people so happy. I always thought, this just does not happen, and it did. What happened to your hands? Car crash, engine caught fire. But you are living the life, bro. But we're rolling with the kings now, huh? <laughs> 
They don't even see us. They're all up there, living. Am I stuck here in this? That's no life, bro. So what are you gonna do about this monkey man? <laughs> That was a clip from the movie Monkey Man. It's Bill McCuddy's personal choice as we go around the panel with our critics' picks of the month. Bill. Well, this is a head-scratcher for me because I think it should be a $300 million movie, and by the time you're watching this show, it's probably streaming. Please watch it. Uh, Dev Patel is uh, in I'm, India. I'm he's a young man, and he's fighting his way to uh, the top of the corrupt police captain chain who's responsible for uh, his mother's death. This is Gladiator meets The Raid, if you remember that, about the building, and uh, a little bit of John Wick. Except as opposed to John Wick, except for a guy's dog dying being the whole backstory, this has an amazing backstory. This is a really, really good film, head and shoulders above any other action movie this year, and it will be on my top ten. Roger, what you pick this month? Okay, I, I love rock and roll documentaries. You and made one. I made one, <laughs> and the best one is made by D.A. Pennebaker, and there have been hundreds of others but there's a lot of movies now being made about the rolling stones and about because there's a great they're a great story that goes on and on for 60 years this is the uh, story of anita pallenberg the movie is called catching fire and it's about it's anita pallenberg who is keith richards common law wife She's and girlfriend and, and the mother of his first three mom. children unfortunately one of the children died but the and she has passed away but the older children have made this movie from a manuscript that they found after their mother passed away. Scarlett Johansson reads from the manuscript and narrates the movie. And uh, Nita Pallenberg was a cool, cool lady who was uh, the muse for all of the Stones and for Keith. Uh, she was very cutting edge, like Marianne Faithful, and like some of the others. And this is where the Stones got their song ideas and sort of their fashion ideas. And she really pushed the envelope and was the model for what has become The Rock Wife. Uh, it's a terrific film with a, a sad ending because the last part of her life was very difficult. It involved uh, a young man, an uh, underage guy, dying in her bed, and nobody really ever knew the story of what happened to him. But it was a very rock and roll thing at the time. Now it would be considered, you know, like a cancellation. Creepy. <laughs> Creepy. But at the time, it was very rock and roll. And... Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful look at the Stones. Keith Richards is very involved in it and very respectful of her. And uh, I highly recommend it if you love rock and roll music. What's really interesting about this documentary is I had no idea who this woman was before oh, you I didn't saw know? this. No, and okay. not only that, the fact that Keith Richards bothering. was so in love she with her, yes. you know, and when Mick Jagger slept Somebody with her, and it was a one-sided love affair, that's, and she, he could, Mick Trump Jagger couldn't get what he wanted back from her, which inspired the song, you can't always get what right. you want, that's right. and then when Keith rising, Richards gets jealous, that inspires Keith Richards to write show and give me shelter, and as a Stones fan, I found that to be just, like, remarkable. Lisa, what you pick this month? Okay, mine is Love Lies Bleeding. Okay, premise. This is the latest from St. Maud director Rose Glass, and it stars Kristen Stewart as the manager of a really cruddy uh, New Mexico gym. And she falls for Katie O'Brien, who is a bodybuilder with a murky backstory and psychopathic tendencies. So you cue murders, organized crime. There's a local overlord who's played by Ed Harris uh, and happens to be Stewart's dad um, in the movie. Uh, there are some truly bizarre hair pieces and a few supernatural flourishes, and you've got the gist. I am not going to pretend that this 80-set lesbian noir is for everyone, but honestly, I have not been able to stop thinking about its sort of saturated eroticism, its neon, gonzo aesthetics ever since I saw it. It's a true original, and we don't get to say it that, that very often anymore. My pick is the TV series Hacks, which begins its third season this month. Now, if you're not familiar with the series, it's about a 72-year-old stand-up comic whose career has seen much better days. She's played by Jean Smart. It's about the unlikely, often contentious relationship she forms with a 20-something canceled comedy writer played by Hannah Einbinder. Smart hires her to make her act less stale and more relevant. At the end of season two, everything was neatly wrapped up for both characters, and I didn't think there was anywhere to go with the show. The creator, Paul W. Downs, who also plays her agent here, has found a way. He makes Gene Smart's character a viable candidate to take over an extremely late-night talk show. So, of course, she needs Einbinder's help to make it work. It's very funny, very good, and as the last two seasons brilliantly did, continues to look at the generational problems of both an aging prima donna boomer and a struggling outcast millennial. 
If you've never seen the series, binge it all. And if you are familiar, the third season doesn't disappoint. From the acting to the writing to its themes, it's really good. I am a huge fan of the show. I've loved Jean Smart forever. I love that she's reinvented herself with this. I think Hannah's really brilliant. People forget that she's actually the daughter of SNL's Lorraine Newman, and she brings all those comedic chops to everything she does. Like, to me, this show is helping HBO find its way again. Think about all the famous actors that have spun off into sitcoms that went absolutely nowhere, and this is so great because she is the smart choice for this. Mm -hmm. Well, the smart thing was that they did wrap up after season two. It seemed like it had c concluded. And then they do a, a year's time jump. <laughs> That's how they get away with figuring right. out what to do next. So that if they had picked it up right away, it wouldn't have made any sense. But the year's time jump is good. And I love the fact that the show started out with uh, ELO's evil woman uh, <laughs> as a description of the Gene Smart character. Deborah, after your special, your career's never been hotter. Did you ever think you'd be back on top? Yes. She hired new writers. You know what? She hired two, which is actually a compliment, isn't it? She had to replace you with two people. Wow. Well, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank my panelists, Bill McCuddy, Lisa Rossman, and Roger Friedman. I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures.